I had a great interview today with somebody that you're going to be interested in hearing from. His name is Marcos. He owns Equiassist. It's a law firm, an immigration law firm here in Monta, a place I don't remember, but he mentions it in the video. We talked about visa, the process of getting a visa, the differences between the investor visa, the pensioner's visa, and the nomad visa, and we talked about a few other things. I'm Don Shader, and when I come back, I'm going to share this interview with you. Hey! Oh, Rocket Chick. Roger. Hello there. Okay, I'm sitting here in the office of Equa Assist. And this is, you're the proprietor, right? You're Marcos. Yes. Marcos, please pronounce your last yeah, name. Yeah, absolutely. Chiluisa. Chiluisa. Yes. Chiluisa. Okay. How long have you had this business? Uh, 11 years now. Okay. Um, I started back in Bahia. That was the first office. And then um, we started the, the office in Cuenca and then Manta. Uh, followed to that was Quito and finally Salinas. So we have five offices in Ecuador. Oh, Quito, do. Cuenca, Salinas, Manta, and Bahia de Caracas. Now, do you travel amongst all those? Well, you know, like years ago, before the pandemic, I um, started like having the system mm -hmm. to speak with my clients uh, over over video conference. Yeah. So it was easy for us from years ago. So I don't I don't have to travel. And the back back in the time, I used to travel a lot. I used to drive. 10 hours from Bahia to Cuenca every 15 days, spend 10 days there, and then coming back to the coast. Okay. But that was the, the beginning of yeah. Equasist. Yeah, so what is the main scope of your business? I mean, you I know you do visas, mm -hmm. you do uh, end of life uh, preparation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what else? A any other legal stuff that you do, or is it just mainly visas? And explain the scope of your operation. Yeah, of course. Well, basically what we provide is a service for a person who would like to live in Ecuador. Okay. First, they need their visas. They need mm -hmm. to have an immigration status here in Ecuador. Second, they need to find a home, whether it's they purchase or they rent. Okay. If they are purchasing real estate, we help them with the real estate process of acquiring a new property here in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. There are so many questions about what is the difference between buying in the U.S. or Canada or here in Ecuador. It's very different, but at the end of the day, it is a very straightforward process. Yeah. So who's your client? Is it mostly expats or? 99% of 99. them, they are expats. Okay. From the U.S. and Canada. Okay. All right. Do you ever get any from other parts of the world, like yeah, Australia? Yeah, uh, sometimes from Australia, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes from the UK, uh, Switzerland too, but they are not very common, at least for our office. Okay, but it's mostly, mostly a, a North American. North yeah. Americans, okay. yes, correct. I like your sign on, on the wall, expert services for the expat. Yeah. And, and I noticed that it's trademarked too. Yes, so, it is. Good. It is. Okay, so when I first talked to you or was introduced to you by our good friend next door, I actually was introduced to you by Carlos Ramirez at Blue Box next door. Mm -hmm. And you, and he basically gave us our introduction and you sent me an email with these topics and I'm going to just read these off real quick. And this is what we're going to talk about because I think this is perfect for mm -hmm. what the expats want to know. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about Changes in the new law issued on February 18, 2022, this year, mm -hmm. the digital nomad visa, investor visa, and what happens once you become permanent, permanent resident? Yes. 21 months of temporary residency to qualify for as permanent residency and visa applicant. And then we're going to talk about end of life documents, wills, medical power of attorney, affidavit of remains state planning and purchasing mm -hmm. your real estate property with U.S. and Canada-based trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. So, let's start with the first one. Changes in the law issued in February of this year. Okay, well, a little bit of background. We had a, we have immigration law since back in the 70s. Okay. This law was changed or was updated in February of 2017. So, when we have this law, 
uh, before we only had the permanent residency visa. With the new law from 2017, we have temporary and permanent residency visa. Under the temporary residency visa, uh, we have some categories. We have the pensioner's visa, we have the investor visa, professional visa. Most of the categories for two years, this visa is issued. Okay. Then after that, you can apply for the permanent residency visa and you don't have to renew, you don't have to do anything else. Yeah. So in the recent changes that we have from February 18 of 2022, it was made some adjustments to the law because no law is perfect. Right. So one of the adjustments was uh, if you are going to be applying for your permanent residency visa, the law said you have to continuously be living in Ecuador for 21 months. So that left a lot of people outside of being eligible to apply for permanent residency visa. With this change, they made it clear that you continuously be living in Ecuador to be uh, to qualify for your permanent residency visa as long as you are in Ecuador for 21 months continuously and you have the opportunity to travel outside of Ecuador within these 21 months up to 90 days. Okay. So that was a big change for a lot of people because most of them, they have to go back to the US or Canada. Uh, they have family there. They have, I don't know, weddings, yeah. um, different things that they Lots have. Lots of reasons, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it was so hard for, for at least one solid year that we didn't have these changes in the law. And right now it is possible to travel up to 90 days within these 21 months before becoming eligible to apply for the permanent residence visa. Okay. That's one of the major change, changes in the, in the law. Then we have the new, the new type of visas like the uh, digital nomad visa, autonomous worker visa. Those, this is very, very new. Yeah. Explain uh, that, if you will, the, the mm -hmm. digital nomad Visa because I just heard about that just mm -hmm. within the last like three or four months. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that that's a brand new mm -hmm. visa, right? Yes. Explain that, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, with the new changes in the law, we have this digital nomad visa. That it was it was the Ministry of Tourism mm -hmm. who brought it up to the new law because with all the changes after the pandemic, more people they started coming here to Ecuador. They work from here, they get paid outside of Ecuador. So it is a good deal for a lot of people that they want to live in Ecuador because of the expenses are always lower, lower than, yeah. for example, in the US. Sure. So for, for the Ministry of Tourism with this great vision, they saw it like an opportunity to attract more people to start coming here to Ecuador. So we have certain requirements. The requirements are they have to be under the list of the Ministry of Tourism, which mostly most of the countries are right now. Uh, there are 146 countries uh, registered within mm -hmm. the uh, Ministry of Tourism list. Then we have the, um, the requirement that you need to have an income. You, you have to prove that you have an income that is minimum of three minimum wages. Mm -hmm. The minimum wage in Ecuador is 425 for 2022 mm -hmm. and uh, the three minimum wages will be $1,275 that you have to prove that you are receiving for the last for the past three months okay. before the application okay. of the digital nomad visa. Okay. You need to prove that you have a relationship with a client outside of Ecuador that you are providing that you are actually providing those services. Okay. One or you can have more than one client outside of Ecuador. So is that the same as having to prove that you're employed? Yes, it, that yeah, you're providing yeah. a service okay, for someone right. else outside of Ecuador. Okay, that's that's the it. concept of the law. Yeah. Or you have, if you don't have that income, you can prove that you have at least $30,600 in your account okay. at the time of the application. So that qualifies you, makes you qualified for the application of the digital nomad visa. Okay, so now in regards to that, mm -hmm. are you required to have, to show proof that you've had that $30,600 yeah. in your account? In your account. It has to be, by the time of the application, they want to see that money okay. there. Okay, that's all. They just want to see that's, that. It's there. That's all. That's a requirement. Okay. That's all what right. the law requires. Okay. Uh, so you can have a contract with one person of different people outside of, of Ecuador, mm -hmm. or you can prove that you are the owner 
of a business okay. that provides uh, services outside of Ecuador. Yeah. So um, in the US, you have the good standing um, certification. Mm -hmm. So that, that document will be enough proof uh, to apply here in case you don't have different people that different contracts yeah that will attract a lot of younger people too mm -hmm. you know absolutely I, I know that there's some that live in the building that that i live in and they came here and that's what they're here on so if you don't mind explain in a nutshell the difference between an investor's visa and a pensioner's visa yeah. i know there's a big difference yes <laughs> so yeah. but absolutely. a lot of people are a little confused about this okay. okay okay good question that's that's a good question okay first we have the the investor visa and the pensioner's visa mm -hmm. for the investor visa we have three subcategories you can apply for the investor visa investing in ecuador for a minimum of 100 minimum wages which for 2022 is forty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. You can invest whether it's real estate, a certificate of deposit in an Ecuadorian bank. Okay. Uh, under the Ecuadorian financial system, we have private banks, public banks, uh, the credit unions. Yep. So you can invest on any of them. You also will be protected up to thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars. That's the the insurance that the government's warranty. Yeah. That's that Cosidi. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's correct. Or you can invest in shares of an Ecuadorian company. Okay. For for what is the most common investor in real estate or investors in a CD? Okay. My personal advice: if you're going to buy shares in a company, you have to know the business very well. Okay. Because there is no guarantee that you will be recovering your your money. Right. It's just a contract. So the real estate and the um, certificate of deposit will be the best and most secure option. Okay. So the investor visa it will be issued for two years. Two uh, years. Two, two years. years. Okay. And it is a multiple entry uh, visa that will allow people to to stay outside, travel sure. outside, back and forth from, from Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Then we have the pensioner's visa. Yeah, yeah. The pensioner's visa requires a, that you have an income from the government. Okay. Whether if you are, if you have a disability pension or if you have a- Social Security. Social Security or retirement mm -hmm. pension. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the minimum income that you need to, that is required to apply for the pensioner's visa is $1,000. Two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Okay, that's the minimum, and okay. this is very, very important for people in Canada because with the exchange rate, oh, sometimes okay. they have to pay a lot of attention. And we have here in this office uh, people that they were just missing for thirty dollars. Mm -hmm. They they didn't meet the requirement of one hundred one thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars. Right. Right. So this visa. It will be issued for another for two years too, and you can renew as many times you you want. Right now, the difference between between the two of them is the investor visa. You cannot sell your property, okay. or you cannot withdraw the funds from the bank All right. for the length of the visa for two years. For two years, okay. And for the pensioner's visa, you are always you're supposed to receive that that amount of that money. Income, yeah. That that income, correct? Yeah. And after, so here, after 21 months, you can apply for the permanent residency visa mm -hmm. and the rule of not leaving Ecuador for more than 21 months, with the exception that you can be outside of Ecuador up to 90 days. Okay. So here's a good question for you. Yes. Let's say I come in on an investor's visa. Mm -hmm. Let's say I buy $80,000 worth of CDs. Yes. And then... I let the CDs mature mm -hmm. and I pull that money out of the CD. Do I lose my visa? In theory, yes. You have 30 days okay. to change your, to get another investment, to buy another CD or to buy a real estate property. The law gives you 30 days to submit okay. this information with them. Okay. Because by the time when you are going to apply for the permanent residency visa, one of the requirements is, okay, done bring me your CD. We want to verify that you still have those funds in the bank. Sure. If you don't have those funds in the bank, they will they will inform you, I'm so sorry, but you cannot apply for the permanent residence visa, but also at the same time, we're notifying you that your visa got canceled. Okay. So you need to maintain your funds okay. in the bank. If you withdraw them, 
you have 30 days to change the investment or to go for another type of visa. Okay, all right, you can go for another type of yes, visa. Yes, you okay. can. All right, all right, good. This is great. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people ask me about this stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, 21 months of temporary, oh, oh, so once you satisfy these requirements and you, let's say you, you make your two years, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. on an investor's visa, and you go two years, do you automatically uh, uh, let's see qualify for a permanent visa, or do you have to apply for it mm -hmm. at that point? You have to apply for yeah, it, right? Yeah, good, okay. good question. Yeah. It's not automatic. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. Right. Um, you, you have to keep your calendar yes. updated. You have to keep the, the accounting of the months that you have with your temporary residency visa, because only after 21st month, it is when you can apply for the permanent residency visa. Yeah. You become eligible to apply for it. And here is something very important because we have this question very often. Um, they ask about, what about the criminal background check? Mm -hmm. So if you're applying for a permanent residency visa, you only need the local criminal background check. The local, okay. Yes, the local criminal okay. background check. If you have left Ecuador more than 90 days, and this is a little bit contradictory with the law, mm -hmm. but what the law says, if you have left more than 90 days, you're can you you you're not uh, eligible to apply for the permanent residency visa. Okay, yeah. But if you, since you are not eligible to apply for the residency visa, but you want to still come into Ecuador, your option will be to renew your temporary residency visa because you have left more than 90 days mm -hmm. but then you have to bring your home country criminal background check got it that's a very that's been important brought up a lot yeah, yeah. that's a very that's, important that's good i want to highlight that in this video and make sure that people understand that yeah i know that before the the income requirement raised to 1275 dollars mm -hmm. it was that it was 12, it was 425. Yes. Like when I came here, it was 425. Mm -hmm. I, the big question that I came up with is if I'm going to come in, why should I bother to come in on an investor's visa? I can just come in on a pensioner's visa mm -hmm. and I can still invest. Yes. And a lot of people do that. But now what's happened is that now they've raised the rate to 1275 and there's a lot of people on fixed income, like mm -hmm. social security income in the United States that want to come here but they don't make twelve seventy five a month. So, but if they have money to invest, like they've sold their house and have money to invest, there is a way for them to come in. D do you think this twelve seventy five uh, requirement is going to last, or do you think you well, think it could go up? Yeah, you think yeah. It could go back Th that's up? that's a good question, and I, I receive the qu this question a lot. Yeah. Um, before, when I started this business, the investment to apply for a permanent residency visa, mm -hmm. it was 1800. I'm oh. talking 15 years ago. Okay. Then at the beginning of 2011, it went up to $20,000, Okay. $20,500. And then little by little has been increased. So my answer for that, even though that I'm, I'm not the person in charge of making the, right. the, the, the right. laws, the law here in Ecuador, but what I see, it will be increased in the future. Okay. Um, we have to take in consideration that we have other countries as competitors are attracting the expat population. Yeah. We have Panama, we have Costa Rica. It is more expensive to, to invest in, in, in Panama or Costa Rica. Ecuador is one of the lowest mm -hmm. places where you can invest and get an investor visa. Yeah. But your question is, is correct. Your assessment yeah. is Let's say you have the funds, but you have a fixed income. My my recommendation will be, uh, we can we can fi figure something out. Like yeah. for example, you can create a, a trust in the U.S. and having this trust paying you this X amount of money every yeah. month. Yeah. So then you meet the requirements, and because also we we, we don't only have the pensioner's visa, we have the rentier visa. Yes. The rentier visa is for those who are receiving at least $1,275 from a private source, whether it's if you're renting a place yeah. outside of Ecuador yeah. or in Ecuador, or if you are receiving a steady income from a private source, mm -hmm. like investments. So if you create a trust, you can qualify it as an investment, and this trust will be paying you $1,275 a month, and then you qualify to for the requirement of the renter visa 
for two years. Sure. So there is a lot to talk about when it comes to visas, mm -hmm. and obviously we're not going to cover all of it here today. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to put in the description all your contact information, mm -hmm. and I encourage all of my family, which is all my subscribers, and I hope it's okay with you, mm -hmm. that if they have questions that we're not covering today, that they can feel free to write to you. And I know for a fact that you are quick to respond. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to, I'm just saying that so that everybody understands that what we don't cover here today, you will be happy to discuss with them through either a Zoom meeting or whatever arrangements that they can make with you, right? Yes. So you're, you're open to that, okay? Yeah, we have a, a 15 minutes a free of charge okay. meetings. Sure. So we schedule then. It's very easy. You go online and you book what the time yeah. is the best for you. Yeah. And yeah, it is very important because every case is unique. Yes, absolutely, so yeah. We have to talk and and confirm when are they coming if they're bringing a container if they're bringing their dogs if they are yeah. a, they're just a family if they they, they change their name mm -hmm. uh, this happens a lot with with the ladies yeah. they that got they married got and then they yeah. go change the name and their criminal background check their fbi background check or the rcmp in canada it has to match with the passport so those little details in 15 yeah. minutes is enough yeah. to cover all that and those little details turn into big details yes absolutely <laughs> i've seen absolutely. that happen i've seen yeah. that happen mm -hmm. to people and even a misspelling a misspelling yes. can be horrendous so well, yeah like I always explain to to our clients like okay let's say your passport says John Michael Smith mm -hmm. but your FBI background check it the says Michael John M. Smith, yeah. John M. Smith. that's a completely different person yes. and then when we're going to apply they will say okay well this doesn't match so you have to go back and get your criminal background check again and we don't want that yeah. for anyone yeah absolutely okay good let's move on to end of life documents mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. Wills. A lot of people have asked me if I've done a will, mm -hmm. and I'm sad to say that no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I'm single by myself. I'm here by myself. Mm -hmm. I have no survivors back home except mm -hmm. for some sisters, but they don't want anything that I have. Mm -hmm. But I know that wills are important. Mm -hmm. So touch on that, if you will. For why, why should why should an expat have a will here? Okay, we have to determine if it's necessary or not. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the inheritance law in Ecuador is very clear. It's just like, it's a legal frame that you can no go one inch outside of this. If a person who have assets here in Ecuador passes away by law, the first beneficiaries are the, their children, mm -hmm. are the children. By law. By law. Yeah. No children, then the parents. Okay. No children, no parents, then the spouse. No children, no, no parents, no spouse, then brothers and sisters, and then nephews and nieces. So there's a hierarchy. Yes. That goes, okay. And whenever you, you're going to draft a will, you have to draft it accordingly with what the law says. You sure. can't overstep saying, I have kids, but I want to leave everything to my sister. You can't can no do, do that. You can't no. That's do very that. interesting. That's very interesting. The reason of that, I'm sorry to interrupt, the mm -hmm. reason of that is because uh, historically, Ecuador is a family-based society. Yes. And it is a multi-family or multi-generational homes mm -hmm. where a grandpa, granddads, a parents, a children and grandchildren, they, see, they live in the same house. But let's say the case of the granddad decided to, I don't know, leave the property to someone else all the family are going to be kicked out. So the, the government, the, the Ecuadorian state, they want to protect the, the assets to be within the family. So okay. that's the reason why this is so strict here in Ecuador. It's just more like a cultural thing rather than in the US, you can leave your assets to any person Anybody. you want. I have seen in the, that you can leave to your dog yeah. too. Yeah. So it's, it's- People have done that. Yeah, I have seen People that. People have done it. So. Okay, so, so there's a structure that to inheritance that you had to follow by law yes. in the United States, there really is no structure no. for will. You can will, like you said, to your dog, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, medical POA, medical power of attorney, what is that? Okay, the medical power of attorney, it came uh, as a solution because 
years ago when I was in Salinas, I heard about a case of a lady in Salinas that it was took to to the ER. I mean, she was she needed a surgery right away. The doctors in Guayaquil they couldn't uh, start the surgery because no no family members uh, were with her. Okay. So they waited two days to have her son flying from the U.S. and authorizing the surgery. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and uh, when the health, when, when their health are, are, is in risk, mm -hmm. you need to act like immediately sometimes. Sure. 48 hours can be uh, uh, something that it cannot end well. So having a power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, authorize a person that you trust to take decisions on your behalf. Um, it, is, it is important that it, power of attorneys, and just want to make a parenthesis here, power of attorneys are only valid as long as the person is alive. Okay. When a person passes away, any power of attorney in Ecuador expires. Okay. So the medical power of attorney helps people that they can be in an emergency and having someone else making decisions making on behalf of this yeah. person. Of okay. course, it will be for something that is for immediate or, or emergencies mm -hmm. um, because this person can have family members or have family or friends outside of Ecuador helping with the decision, but uh, having a person who will be signing on your behalf because the doctors here, they always give you a form, um, yes. disclaimer form mm -hmm. in the US too. But uh, So you have to sign it as representative of this person and that will authorize to proceed with the surgery or any any treatment that it, it sure. will depend on the life of the person got it okay that's good to know mm -hmm. so that's probably something since i'm here by myself i should probably have mm -hmm. a medical power of attorney mm -hmm. we'll talk about that yes. later okay <laughs> okay and then the other one is affidavit of remains what is that yes okay hmm. when um this is something very unusual for us at the beginning when i first started equisys and then it became a problem because uh, we just i mean the, the most recent case of a good client of of this office um, his mom passed away they didn't have anything so it was so hard to go through the system and what it will help you or help your friends or family members is if you have an affidavit saying that I want my remains to be cremated, so that will authorize the funeral service home to proceed and go for the uh, for the cremation. Okay. Because by default, you're going to be buried and there's some people that they don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are, if you want to be very specific about what you want, like you want to be cremated, cremated. So sure. you need to have an, an affidavit of okay. remains. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. The last item there is state planning and purchasing your real estate property with mm -hmm. U.S. and Canada based trust. Yes. You kind of touched on that a little bit when we were talking about the investor's visa. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything more that you can say about that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. If you, um, let's start for the investor visa. Mm -hmm. If you want to apply for the investor visa, you have to purchase real estate under your own name. Okay. Then you become eligible to apply for the investor visa. This part is when you want to have something with your asset, with your real estate here in Ecuador, protect it and not be subject to be under the inheritance law mm -hmm. because would we advise, and this is case by case, when we advise our, one of our clients, one of the questions is, are you familiar with the inheritance laws of Ecuador? What do you want to do with your property if something happens to you? Yeah. Most of our clients, they say, I want to leave the property to my spouse, but I have kids and my parents, they are alive. Mm -hmm. So the best advice for them will be to purchase the property under a trust a trust created in the US or Canada. Why not a trust created here in Ecuador? Creating a trust in Ecuador, it is under the control of the financial system on their banks. So they charge a minimum, just an example of $750 a month 
to manage your trust. The trust basically will be the holder of the real estate property. So our advice is create in the US because you only pay one fee and then this entity, this foreign entity will own the real estate here in Ecuador. And what will happen if something happens to you? You have a will in the US giving instructions to the trust and then whatever those instructions are, it will be dispersing the funds or whatever the, the instructions are, it will be assigning the property to anyone you want. Yeah. So that will prevent to go under the inheritance laws like kids, parents, spouse, brothers and sisters, and that will protect your assets. Okay, so that makes me think of another question. Mm -hmm. I have CDs mm -hmm. at a bank here, Jap Cooperative. Okay, I bought them when I first came here. I don't remember leaving a beneficiary Mm -hmm. when I was there. Even if I did, let's say that I did have a beneficiary and I designated it with the bank, okay? If I have a, a trust or I have instructions from a trust that say what to do with my CDs in the event of my death, mm -hmm. does that override what I instructed the bank to do or which one has the power? That, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. If you go to the bank and you... Um, sign or you have someone to be your beneficiary mm -hmm. that person will be your beneficiary okay if you have a trust or you have a, a will outside of ecuador whatever instructions are you are you gave to the to the trust or the will will not uh, be won't more overrule more or no will overruling yeah. whatever the instructions you gave to the okay. to the bank okay so whatever your are who is your beneficiary, that person will be your beneficiary. Okay, all mm -hmm. right, all right. Okay, good. That's great. All right, uh, let's see here. I That pretty well covers all of that, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to go to this question from Jackie uh, mm -hmm. that we got the email from, and I sent it. It's a little lengthy here, but I'll kind of go through the highlights of it. I sent it to you, and you actually gave me a good answer for it, mm -hmm. but I'll let you talk about it, okay? Mm -hmm. In her question to, to me, she said, for your interview with Equisys, I have a question, would like to remain anonymous. We appreciate that. There is conflicting or unclear advice on the internet. Imagine that. <laughs> so we're hoping to get some clarity. We've read that folks who want to get a temporary visa and ship their personal goods are limited to receive a one-time duty-free container. Is there any such a thing as a duty-free container? Mm -hmm. There is? Yeah, okay, yeah, let's is. touch on that for a minute. It is. Uh, you have six months after you receive your temporary residency visa to bring a container tax-free to, to Ecuador. Okay. I'm not the expert for containers, but that's what the law says, and I have to know about this. Mm -hmm. You only have six months to get your visa and well, and settler uh, before you can bring your a uh, tax-free container. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes it is it possible that it could actually take more than six months for your container to get here. It's not a matter of, of that. Uh, uh, the immigration process here in Ecuador, uh -huh. the longest is six to eight weeks. Okay. That's what it, it takes to get your a uh, temporary residency visa. Yeah. The problem here can be if a person sends their container before arriving to Ecuador, mm -hmm. or they have another plan. So mm -hmm. it comes when they are applying and their visas or their visas are not ready yet, but they send the months before coming to Ecuador their containers. So it is more a problem like that. Okay. So whenever that happens, when we have our clients, like we know that their containers are coming, we can expedite the, the, process. the process of the visa okay. application because we send a letter and most of the time, 99% of the time, they expedite the process okay. for the, the approval. And when we say duty-free, mm -hmm. we're talking about, I mean, there's no tax on that? That's everything in that container? Or? Yeah, it has to be personal belongings. Okay, it personal, has to be belongings. personal belongings. Okay. It's not like you can bring 50 a 52 inches TV. Yeah. So that will not be considered a, as a personal belonging. It's yeah. just like you can bring two or three TVs for your home, yeah. a, one, two kitchens, 
a uh, one stove. Sure. A, but if you have like 20 laptops in that container. Yeah, you can't. You're you can, gonna, but if you do, you're going to be taxed on those laptops, right? If, if it's a personal, for mm -hmm. personal use, mm -hmm. you, you will not. Okay. Right. As long as but, there are no But it's not reasonable to think quantities. that a person would bring 20 items, no, like that, say 20 MacBook Pros. No, no, no. no. You that, know, that, no. that doesn't look right. Then you will, you will be taxed. You'll be taxed on yes. that. Okay, yeah. so you, it has to be reasonable. Yeah. You know. it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter because most of what I have heard is most of the time they make an inspection on, yes. on the container. So they go and, and verify whatever is, because you have to submit a list, a list of yes. what is a, within the container. Yeah, the container. Yeah. So it's very easy for them to verify. Okay, well, this person has two 52 inches TV, mm -hmm. a one bed, a, 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 sure. a, and other items. Let's go and see if this is true. Yeah. So they go and count. But what if it says, I have been to 20 MacBooks? It's just yeah. like, okay, no, well, this is yeah. a red flag. Yeah. So uh, she didn't ask this question, but I just thought of it. This list, does all that have to be in Spanish? It has to be in Spanish. Too. It has to be in Spanish. Okay. Be in Spanish. I, somebody actually argued with me about that mm -hmm. once, and they said, "Well, you know, it's coming from the United States. Why can't it be in English?" And I said, "Well, it's coming to Ecuador." Yes, yes. Yeah, and they speak Spanish here, yes. so it has to be. It does have to be in yeah, Spanish. It has to be your in list. Spanish. Yeah. If you're sending your list in English, you have to find a translator to, to make translate the translation. Yeah, and then you file it. So you better Spanish. have that done before you ship it. Oh yeah, absolutely. That yeah, needs to go with your manifest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she said in another paragraph, we completed our Cuenca exploratory trip 30 days in May of 2022. We did not find a place to lease. We planned to both get temporary investor visas, which we heard were the fastest and easiest to obtain. Mm -hmm. At this time, our plans are to pursue eventual citizenship. Mm -hmm. So she goes on to say, we might need more than 90 days to, place, to find our place and only have 60 days left on our initial tourist stamp. We'd like to explore options to stay as long as possible with tourist status and want to know the most creative ways to make this happen. Her question was, are the days calculated as rolling or anniversary dates or calculated as calendar dates? Does something ma magical mm -hmm. happen on January 1st? Mm -hmm. You understand what she's asking? Yes. In this, in this scenario possible, stay 90 days on initial tourist stamp. I thought it was more than 90 days, but it's not. It's yeah. only 90 days, yes. right? Okay. I, I explain this in all of our meetings. Okay. Because the accounting of those initial 90 days, it is very important for the success of an eventually visa application here in Ecuador mm -hmm. or the need of applying for an extension. How it works is this, like this. So today is June 22nd, 2022. Okay. Let's say someone is arriving today. From June 22nd, 2022, until June 22nd of 2023, you have 90 days. When you're arriving at the airport, they will stamp you 90 days. Yeah, stamp Let's say your passport. They stamp your passport. Right. Let's say in your first trip, you only are in Ecuador for 15 days. Mm -hmm. So you leave. The next time when you're coming, you have a remaining of 75 days. Got it. The next time you're coming, you spend in Ecuador 30 more days. Mm -hmm. So when you're coming back on your next trip, on your third trip, you are going to have 45 days left when you are entering Ecuador. So they will stamp you again. They will not give you 90 days. They only right. will give you 45 days because that's what the system says. Mm -hmm. So you can only use this 90 days up, up to until uh, June 22nd of 2023. Got it. So what if you want to stay longer within this year? Mm -hmm. You can apply for an extension. Okay. The extension will be issued for 90 days. 90 days. The big right. difference between the first 90 days and the extension 90 days is the 90 day extension will expire on a certain date. Yeah. yeah. So you only will receive 90 days until let's say um, October 15. Mm -hmm. So only until that date you can apply for a temporary residency visa. Okay. Keep in mind that obtaining the documents in Canada or the US, it takes between two months and two months and a half. 
So if a person is here as a tourist, it will have to keep in consideration those two or two months and a half to get the documents in the US, unless they already have them here. But if they're coming on an exploratory trip, I'm assuming that they don't have any of their documents here in Ecuador which it can be obtained from Ecuador. Yeah, I, when you replied to me this morning, I forwarded that, forwarded that message back to Jackie. And um, Jackie, I'm telling you now that if you have any more questions about this, feel free to write to Marcos and, and you'll, you'll be able to explain it to her. So I noticed on your, your email that you have some credentials here. You are a member of the Ecuadorian Canadian Chamber of Commerce you're also a member of the Ecuadorian American Chamber of Commerce, and you are a Immigration Law Firm of the Year in Ecuador since 2016, mm -hmm. and you have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on yeah, that. Thank you. That's a big one. The, and you're also a member of the International Bar Association. Yes. On my, my email, your, the logo for it didn't yeah. show up. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah, well, it was the logo there, but yeah. So, so when people come to Ecuador and they want to apply for a visa, and we tell them, I tell them, you know, come to, uh, here comes one of my, you can let him in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, We're doing a video. <laughs> When the magazine? Yeah, sure. Please take it. That'll be a Which one do you want? The new one. Huh? The new one. Do you have the new one? Oh. It's a dollar fifty. Here. <laughs> all, right, look, all right, two dollars in zeros. Okay. In your carro thing. Yeah. That's Melvin. Okay. So, so people will will come here. And they'll come to Equisys to get their legal work done, their mm -hmm. wills, get their their visa application submitted. Why should they come to you? Why? Yeah. Okay. The way we provide our service is the way how all of us we would like to receive the service. We send weekly updates to our clients. We guide them on how to obtain their documents in the U.S. They are. A lot of details that they need to consider whenever they are obtaining the documents. We understand that our clients they are not getting apostille or they are not getting their criminal background check all the time. So this can be confusing and it is new. And if you go online and you read blogs and you want to do it by yourself, at some point you can figure it out. But the information that we will be providing here in our weekly updates is go to this office or mail it to this office with a prepaid envelope and a money order, and you will be expecting the results within the next two weeks. So the person knows exactly what will happen along the process. Once we, are, once we know the, the, we have the, the documents, we ask our clients to send them to us. We verify that everything is okay, and we start making the translations here. Once we have that, when our clients come and apply in person, we go with them to apply. That, and this is the easiest part. Mm -hmm. Going to apply at the visa office is the easiest part because you only have to wait there for two or three hours and then apply. But we know in advance that we have fulfilled the requirements for our clients to warranty that they will get their residency visas here in Ecuador. Now, is it necessary for everybody that's applying for a visa to actually go in for an interview? Um, if you have a if you have a background, if you have a criminal background, criminal background, then yeah. you have to go for an interview. Okay. Um, we are very careful, and in our initial meeting mm -hmm. or after reviewing the documents, uh, we ask about this. Okay. After reviewing the documents, we verify with our clients, okay, what happened here? Yeah. And if there is any extra document that they need to provide in order to justify, because mm -hmm. for the meeting, for the interview, they are always asking what happened. Mm -hmm. And we have some of our clients that the case got dismissed. Yeah. So if they have proof from court, from the court that says, yes, the case was dismissed, mm -hmm. or we call the court from here, from here, from Ecuador, and we get a document from, from, from the US or, or Canada, mm -hmm. 
And then whenever we go to the interview, our client will go prepare for, for that. Okay. So what if you have a client that doesn't want to go for that interview? Can you go on their behalf with a power of attorney or yeah. it, uh, how we, does that work? We advise not to do that. Okay. Because they want to see, they they want, want to see, see you. they yeah. want to see you, they want they want Ecuador, the Ecuadorian government. Uh, of course, they want to make easy for for people to come, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's just they want to see. Ecuador is more like a relationship culture, yeah. where they want to see well, how do you react yeah. and how I mean how how do, how do, it's how are you in, in the for mm -hmm. that situation? So. They, they want to see you in person. Yeah. Why is it, speaking for Monta, why is it that you can't get your cedula here in Monta? Oh yes, that's a long story. <laughs> Years ago, probably back in, before 2010, uh, Manabi was authorized to issue visas, okay. uh, cedulas. Manabi, yeah. Manabi. So what happened after that it was that they found foreigners with settlers that they didn't have visas. Oh. So, because- <laughs> I wonder where they got those. <laughs> yeah. Those are two complete different agencies. Yeah. One is yeah. the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the other is the Civil Register. Okay. So, I mean- Two different something, agencies. See, something I didn't know that. happened yeah. between the communication between the two of them. Yeah. So, the civil register was issuing visas for people that they didn't have their settlers. So right now, you only can obtain it in Quito, Guayaquil, or Cuenca, yeah. which are the most important cities here in Ecuador, sure. and they have more control on that. Probably in the future, uh, we have more technology in Ecuador, and I don't see that like impossible to have a, in, 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 Ma in Manabi yeah. a, a civil register issue and say for foreigners. Okay. For a single person coming to Ecuador mm -hmm. that wants to get a visa, let's just say a pensioner's visa, mm -hmm. what is the average cost involved in doing that? Okay. It can be... Just be average. No, yes, no. yes, of course. It can be between 13 to 1700. Okay. What is the, the big gap is because in Ecuador, when you are over 65, mm -hmm you get a 50% discount in all yes. the government fees. Yeah. So if you are over 65, 65 it can be 1300 uh, inclu including government uh, attorney fees. Yes. And it can be 1700 depending on, on, on how many pages do you have in your criminal background check okay. because that has to be translated. We have here uh, clients with over 10 pages of their FBI background check, wow. so it yeah. needs more, more. Most of them, they were DUIs, yeah. but I, it's yeah. just like. Mine was three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so last question. Yes, of course. This is a good one too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, mainly because I thought of it. <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion yes. about using facilitators yes. to go get your visa. Yeah. I know people here that literally got screwed out of their money by mm -hmm. a facilitator. Mm -hmm. I also know somebody here, they got screwed out of their money by a facilitator, but the facilitator made it right and gave them their money back. Okay. Okay. What is the best case scenario for, for I mean, why, why should they use Equisist mm -hmm. or any law firm for that matter, or any visa firm mm -hmm. to get a visa as opposed to using a facilitator that's working as a retired attorney Mm -hmm. Doing it on the side and doing okay. it cheap. What good, is, good, good. That's know. a good question. For me, uh, when I when I receive this question, I always say, "This is like going to a restaurant. You can cook at home. You have the recipe. Mm -hmm. You can do it yourself. There's no problem. It will taste as good as going to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. But whenever you go to a restaurant, you don't have to do the dishes. You don't have to cook. You don't have to buy the uh, the food to cook, you don't have to be there. So you just go sit, pay your bill, leave a, a tip, and then you leave. So our, our services are provided like, okay, we want you to feel comfortable whenever you're coming with us, because yeah. that's the type of service that we are used to, like equities, like all for us, 
that's very important. Or you can go to, um, I don't know, uh, a street vendor, and mm -hmm. you don't know where if where they go to do their dishes, and sure. it is more, it can be a little bit more, more like uh, informal. It will be less expensive because they have less um, costs. But for, for us, yeah. it's just like they come here and they feel comfortable. And also taking the time of sending those weekly updates, that's, that's very, very important for us. Yeah. Because having clients without communication is like just navigating in the dark. So we try to give them every week yeah. the, the best communication. You know what my answer is? Mm -hmm. My answer is that a mistake can be deadly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. It can co be costly, and you don't want to deal with that. It's mm -hmm. it's better to go to the professionals and let them mm -hmm. let them make the mistakes, yes. or let them find the mistakes mm -hmm. and correct them. And if you try to do it on your own or do it with a facilitator, you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I'm I'm making the assumption like it, there there's, I mean, of course we're humans, mm -hmm. but we we go to the visa office right now we have some some applications and we're retrieving some visas right now so we go there every single day so whenever they have something new we know the same day yeah and we can communicate that to our clients and yeah. of course yeah uh, mistakes can be very very expensive yeah no i said that was the last question i actually have one more short yes. last one is it true that you should not do your own english spanish translation Yes, it is. It is true because there is a conflict of interest. Conflict so of interest, whenever yeah. they see, okay, this John Michael Smith is FBI background check, and the translation is the Spanish person is signed by John right, Michael yeah. Smith. So it is a conflict of interest, okay. and um, you you are not allowed to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Marcos. Well. I really appreciate it. Thank I think so this has been a fantastic interview, and I'm going to put. All your information in the description down mm -hmm. below. I'm going to tell people, I, I know people are going to write and ask me questions, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell them to write to you. Okay. okay. Thank you. I don't like giving advice, and everybody on my channel knows I don't give advice. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that to the professionals. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.